Hi, welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Randy, and this YouTube channel is dedicated to the development and construction of the Lake Erie and North Shore Railroad. So I hope you'll join me in all our adventures and have some fun as we go through the trials and tribulations of developing a railroad. So join us for this first episode, which is the background and the history and the track plan of the Lake Erie and North Shore Railroad. Stay with us. Let's go listen to the cool song, then we'll start. Across the prairies to the sea. Hi, and welcome back. I uh, hope you enjoyed the um, Railroad Soul song and uh, the little video introduction. Now, I just wanted to start by saying the reason I'm doing this uh, sort of introduction overall um, track plan and development uh, in the history of the railroad is because I'm a, I'm a big fan of the TSG Live uh, programming uh, that John Abbott-Cola does. And uh, I was listening to one of the episodes in which Brian Henderson was talking about layout design. And he said it's really good to have an idea or a concept of why the railroad exists so that it can develop in a more natural way. Now, I'll be the first to admit, like a lot of things in railroading, uh, in model railroading, I've, uh, I've done it uh, wrong. So I've done things out of order and I uh, got a lot of the uh, layout designed and planned and ideas floating around in my head before I actually sat down and, and worked through uh, the concept of okay what what is this railroad here for and what businesses is it going to serve what industries is it going to serve and uh, how is it going to develop over time those types of questions so I thought I'd uh, go back and uh, look at a little bit of the history of the area and investigate why I'm interested in this. Uh, and hopefully it'll spark some interest in you to maybe do the same thing with your railroad or uh, uh, maybe you just want, you just enjoy, you know, uh, hearing the history of different railroads. So the map that you see here is the uh, Grand Trunk Line. Now this Grand Trunk Line is basically the, the, the backbone or the, the bones of the prototype that I'm modeling, okay, loosely modeling. Uh, now this is, it has a very interesting history and, and uh, I'll just go into it a little bit. But the Grand Trunk Line usually went from uh, Eastern Canada, so out in New Brunswick, all the way into uh, about uh, the tip of uh, Lake Michigan and then it moved off on another sort of uh, division up here uh, going north to Lake Superior across to the border of Ontario and Manitoba. So that was the original Grand Trunk Line and this Grand Trunk Line was owned by a bunch of businessmen in England and they were approached by the Canadian government to continue the line west out to British Columbia. And they decided that it was not fiscally uh, reasonable to do that, so they declined that offer. And then the <clears throat> that opened up the uh, potential or the opportunity for another business to take on that uh, challenge. And that's when the Canadian Pacific Line came into existence. 
So the Canadian Pacific Line ran the railroad lines from Ontario all the way across to, the, to British Columbia. Now, interestingly enough, the uh, businessmen uh, that owned this Grand Trunk line uh, decided that it wasn't lucrative enough and they approached the Canadian government to see if they would nationalize it, buy it from them, basically. And so that developed the Canadian National Railway. So now we see the development of the CN, the Canadian National Railway, and the CP, the Canadian Pacific Railway, and why they came into development and why they're such bitter rivals even until this day. So uh, this is the, uh, the Grand Trunk Line. Now, if we just look, I wanna take a, 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 and blow up some of this Grand Trunk Line because this area right here around Simcoe, Port Dover, okay, this is where I grew up. And believe it or not, we, uh, our house was located about 500 feet from one of these uh, railroad lines. And uh, this was a great, uh, part of my childhood. Uh, we would uh, get up, uh, you know, we would go to bed all excited Friday night and get up on Saturday morning very early and pack a lunch and then hike down these lines, hike down the railroad tracks and see what we could find, see how far we could get and, uh, you know, spend the day basically exploring these railroad lines. And of course, every once in a while you'd hear the rumble and, the, and you'd feel the the, the movement of the rails and you'd know, okay, train's coming. So you gotta get, off, gotta get out of the way. Now back in those days, uh, you know, the engineers would blow the horn and wave as they went by. It was quite exciting for a kid, you know, putting uh, pennies on the line, putting pennies on the rails and getting them flattened and all kinds of things. So it was only natural for me and my brother to actually start to do model railroading. And we probably started around the age of 10 or 11. And uh, we had the old four by eight, you know, layout. Uh, and then we started to expand and develop ideas and do things. Now, nothing ever worked right <laughs> because we didn't really have the skill to do it. But it was that sort of passion and excitement and uh, that got me, anyway, into model railroading. And I've been doing it on and off since then. So uh, I just wanted to bring up this, uh, this part of the Grand Trunk Railroad, which was uh, a big part of my childhood uh, in the uh, Simcoe Port Dover area. Uh, hiking those lines was quite exciting. So now uh, let's get to the uh, actual um, Lake Erie and North Shore Railroad which is going from Hamilton. So it's about 150 miles. So from Hamilton down to Windsor, back up to Sarnia. So we've got this loop between Windsor and Sarnia, which is gonna be important in a minute, and I'll explain that to you. And then we have this other uh, connection from Hamilton to Buffalo. And there was a, an actual railroad called the Hamilton Toronto Buffalo Railroad, which uh, then has merged into the CN line, so, uh, or into the CP line. The CP is the red uh, color and the CN is the blue color. And you can see that they have uh, overlapping areas and uh, there's, a, there's a great rivalry between these two, ra two railroads. Now the Lake Erie and North Shore Railroad is combining both of these onto the same rails. And I'll explain how we're gonna do that, and why we did that, uh, right now. So in about early 1970, the Ontario government decided that they were going to build a power plant and they chose Nanakoke, which is a small little town on the Lake Erie uh, between Hamilton and uh, London, basically. And uh, this power plant was very special because it was the largest power plant in North America at the time. So it was huge. And uh, the, so all the construction of this power plant required rail lines to be lay, laid down. So the interesting thing about this power plant was that in its uh, maximum production, they were estimating that it would consume 35,000 tons of coal per day. 
So that's equivalent to 300, 120 ton cars a day coming into this uh, power plant. And you can see this big area here. This is a big coal pile, okay, which is the reserve that they use in case uh, there's ever a, a shortage or a lack or a delay in, in, uh, develop, in delay in delivery of the coal. Now, around the same time, the U.S. steel company decided they were going to uh, build a steel plant. Okay, so a, a steel production uh, plant right next to the Nanticoke power generating station and use the power from the uh, generating station to uh, help offset the, uh, the cost of producing steel. And so in 1980, roughly, this steel uh, factory came into production and it was capable of making a, uh, making a lot of steel per day and it required about 10,000 tons of coal per day to make coke, which then goes into the blast furnace and causes the uh, temperature to burn at a, at a point that will create iron, which then goes on to the uh, oxygen furnace and creates steel. So we basically between these two industries, itself, the railroads had a tremendous challenge because they needed to, number one, be able to deliver the coal, and number two, be able to deliver it cheaper than the Lake Erie shipping uh, uh, companies, the, the boats that would carry coal into uh, these two plants. So what, uh, now I'm just gonna continue on with the industry development because it was kind of a perfect storm at that time in this area of industry development. And uh, what else happened on this line? So the, the line between uh, Hamilton and London was that Ford decided that they were going to uh, manufacture all of their uh, engines and do their assemblies in the Oakville and Talbotville plants. Uh, and this required transfers of engines via rail from Windsor to Hamilton as well as transfer of steel uh, from the Stelco plant and the engine manufacturing plants, as well as movement of cars out of the Talbotville area all across uh, Canada and the northern United States. As well, at the same time, and I'm telling you, this is why I'm saying it's the perfect storm, and all of this stuff I'm talking to you about right now is actually real. Okay, it really happened. The Canadian Gypsum Company built a wallboard plant in Hagersville, which is a small town uh, just uh, nearby to Hamilton, but it's a small town. Um, interestingly, at Hagersville, we had the, um, the crossing or the um, intersection of the CP and the CN line. Small town Hagersville, uh, where these two lines um, basically uh, intersected, or they had a junction. So, um, the gypsum plant, another huge, huge uh, um, user of rail car because they needed to transfer the wall board out. So the, the wall board that they use to build uh, walls in buildings, apartment buildings and houses, all was produced here and it's made of gypsum. And uh, there was a gypsum mine uh, about 20 miles away, which had to have the gypsum transported to the gypsum plant to make the wall board. So there's a huge uh, need for rail, uh, rail cars to deliver this stuff. It's very, very heavy. Now, also at the same time, the American Can Company uh, expanded in Simcoe, which is another, it was the town that I grew up in. And uh, they expanded and they produced uh, cans for canning of fruits and vegetables and soup, that type of stuff. Anything that can basically go in a can, all the foodstuffs that can go in a can. And as such, they had, they produced products for Campbell's, Del Monte, Heinz, all the big names. And those had to be both, the, the steel for the cans had to be shipped in and the cans then had to be shipped out to uh, ports and locations all the way across North America. So again, the rail cars played a huge part in the 
uh, distribution network of the American CAN system. And then, of course, another development in the Simcoe area was the development of the Kraft Dairy Products Factory. Um, so all of the dairy products uh, needed to have uh, milk delivered in tanker cars and chocolate delivered in tanker cars, corn syrup, uh, <coughs> excuse me, delivered in tanker cars. So another huge use of the uh, rail system in this area, in this tiny 150 mile stretch. And then finally, the uh, General Motors Electromotive Division, 1980, General Motors decided to consolidate all of the building of the engines into the, into the London plant in Ontario. So now they had uh, a huge demand for steel, they had a huge demand for parts to be delivered, um, uh, oil and lubrication um, for um, lubricating the parts. And this plant built the majority of the EMD SD40-2s, so the dash, the dash twos, uh, that were probably the number one selling engine in the world at that point. Uh, also built the EMD SD60s and the EMD GP60s. So uh, this plant was rocking, and at uh, its peak, it could make six locomotive, six locomotive engines per day. So that's a lot of uh, steel and a lot of manufacturing happening um, in just one plant. So all of this stuff is happening and the big thing is the, the railroads, the CP and the CN, decided that they're going to put their rivalry aside and they're going to work together in a, um, in a consortium or a collective to help make sure that they could deliver the coal that was necessary and take the byproducts out of all these industries that were happening along this line. Now, they realized that there was going to be some issues and delivering, uh, you know, 300 cars a day uh, of coal. And that coal had to come, by the way, either from the Canadian coal fields, which were out in Alberta, or the United States coal fields, which were, um, you know, ranging uh, from a lot of different areas in the United States, like Wyoming, West Virginia, Kentucky, Illinois, Pennsylvania. Uh, so they realized quite quickly that if they're going to be competitive and they're going to actually be able to deliver all of the contracts that they were hoping to get, they're going to have to team up with other railroads. So. Uh, what has happened is that in my railroad, so in the Lake Erie and North Shore Railroad, this is where reality may differ from what is actually happening on my railroad. Because on my railroad, all the railroads decided to work together. So they made a, a, a deal that uh, down here in Windsor and in Sarnia, where uh, CSX or the Chessie system had a interlocking, uh, an interchange with CN, that they would allow the uh, uh, engines, so the motive power and end materials from uh, the Chessie system to be, uh, to use the lines, to use the CP lines and the CN lines and to help them deliver and, re and distribute all the products that uh, had to happen. Now, you would realize that at the time, back in 1970, as CSX didn't exist. It was more um, the Chessie system and a bunch of other railroads that then merged into CSX around that time. So on the railroad, you're gonna see Chessie system, you're gonna see CSX, and also these railroads realize that, hmm, they're gonna have to have access to the same areas that the Santa Fe and the Burlington, North, Burlington Northern uh, railways uh, had. So you're gonna see the following engine power on this uh, railroad. So you'll see the CSX, which basically are coming later, because I'm trying to model between uh, 1970 and 1990, so a 20 year period. 
So the CSX came in around 1982, roughly. Uh, the BNSF is going to be the uh, conglomerate or the amalgamation of the Burlington Northern uh, and the Santa Fe. But before that BNSF merger happened, these two railways were using the uh, rails of the Lake Erie and North Shore Railroad. So on this railroad, you're going to see Canadian Pacific Power, CN Power, Santa Fe Power, CSX, chassis system, and BNSF. And all those are justified by the collective that was made to deliver to all these industries that formed the perfect storm of development back in the 1970s and 80s on this line. Now this is the track plan. So the uh, one thing that uh, I need to mention, and that is that the move from uh, Hamilton up to London has to take into account the uh, Niagara Escarpment. Okay, so the Niagara Escarpment is a um, a change in land mass or an altitude difference of about 540 meters. So it's 100. And, it's 1,772 1, feet, and it is uh, the form. It, it is the the reason for the formation of Niagara Falls. So we have to get the trains from Hamilton by the time they get to Hagersville and Simcoe they have to go up this escarpment, okay? So it's a, it's a huge, um, it's a huge uh, challenge for the trains. And on my layout, the dotted lines, so these dotted lines are going underneath the escarpment, so they're tunnels. But this area is where the uh, elevation starts. So we start going up the escarpment, we're going up, we're going up, we're going up, going up, going up, and right about here we flatten off. So there's a, uh, this is all elevated track with a elevation sometimes hitting three degrees, which is a lot. So uh, one of the things I didn't realize when I first started building it, uh, the, the layout was that the six axle trains can't handle going up at a three degree um, sort of incline and navigating curves at the same time. They just derail, especially if the curves are too sharp. So all of this area had to be redone and you'll see in some of the videos where I'm doing that and I take you through how I did that. Uh, the blue areas are areas of the industries that uh, are going to be included in the layout. So over here, uh, this area here in the Hagersville area, this will be the gypsum plant. Uh, this will be the dairy. This will be the American can. This is the mine, uh, the gypsum mine. Uh, this is the GM EMD factory here. Now, the other agreement that was made by these railroads is that because they were going to have their engine power all the way up into Canada, they couldn't afford to have them break down. So there had to be an agreement that there had to be a huge engine facility to deal with all of the different types of uh, motor power that were using these lines. So an agreement was made to build a large en engine facility in Hamilton at the Hamilton Yard. And so that's what this large area here is. Now these industries that are here, I'm uh, thinking of putting uh, probably an ethanol plant and uh, some other uh, some other plant, possibly soybean processing plant or something out here. Now, you'll notice on the track plan, this is phase one. Phase two will come down off here and go into another room where the steel plant and the hydro plant uh, will be built. Okay, so I'm uh, already planning the, the phase two. Now, uh, this big area here is actually um, an access point, uh, which I'm thinking I'm going to put a lake in there. 
but I haven't decided yet. It might just be an industry that I could pop out and uh, still use this as an access point. This line here is a, um, a backdrop that goes across here and separates this part from this part. So these, this area is a different uh, viewpoint. So, um, so you'll see when we go down and uh, go into the actual uh, layout room, you'll see what I mean. So this area here is down lower than the rest of the um, layout, and it's um, it's quite a, a difference. I haven't actually, I can't remember the exact measurement, but it is equivalent to the escarpment. So uh, I'm struggling now to decide how to handle that. So I was uh, watching a uh, an episode of the TSG Live again, and they went and did a uh, railroad tour. I can't remember exactly which tour it was, but they had kind of the same problem where they had to have uh, a, a large incline that they had to have the engines go up and they used um, multiple consorts uh, or consists, multiple consists and a engine at the back of the train. So what I'm having trouble with is uh, some derailments, not derailments, uh, uncoupling. So coming up this last little bit here, there's, there's uh, an area where the cars tend to want to uncouple a little bit. And um, I'm thinking if I have a train on the end or an engine on the end, that uncoupling won't happen. So hopefully I'm going to come up with some ways to uh, get around that. So this is the track plan. Uh, this is the yard at Hamilton. Uh, the trains will go up from there. Come around. They'll, there's this is the interchange here between uh, London and Windsor and Sarnia. So between CSS uh, Santa Fe uh, and Burlington Northern, there's a little yard here at Windsor where uh, the trains can exchange uh, cars for either going east or west, and that's why I had to do these multiple uh, interconnecting. Uh, inter interchange uh, uh, areas and you'll see one of the episodes is me installing this because uh, I didn't have that in there before. So um, we have some videos of the building some components of the engine facility, installing the turntable, um, doing some construction here on the uh, curve reconstruction uh, as well as installing the tracks for the mine. Um, and uh, I'm going to hopefully uh, take you through uh, a journey that is going to be long and winding. Um, what I do try to do is include the actual, at least one actual production event where you see me doing what uh, I am going to be doing, for instance, uh, control panels. So if I'm building a control panel, I show you uh, exactly how long it takes to, to do a section of the control panel. Because I think uh, a lot of the videos that I see anyway, you don't see how long things take. And it, and it does take some time. Uh, and that's important if you're trying to budget your time and say, look, I'm gonna go down tonight and I'm gonna you know, build a control panel. Uh, it's not gonna happen if you've got more than sort of six switches in there. So, because it takes time to actually build them. So I'm, I show, how long it takes and I know a lot of you probably uh, know how to do it and know how to do it way better than I do but uh, I made that commitment to myself to show those things just so that uh, if there are people who you know want to say okay I want to see how he did this all the way through uh, you can watch it you can rewind it or you can skip through it you can you know fast forward through it if you already know how to do it or you don't need that um, and I have no <laughs> I have no qualms about people, you know, um, picking w what parts they like to see and what, what parts they don't. Um, this is just a, a, a YouTube channel to help everybody uh, understand sort of the challenges that you might go through uh, and try to give you some tips of things that I've learned um, that uh, I know that we're going to have a whole episode on um, the PM42 programming and the PM42 
that's the Digitrax PM42 and power distribution stuff because I found it totally confusing and the directions were brutal. So uh, it, you, you do a little bit of trial and error and then you, you know, eventually you find it. But it's way easier if you can just do it all, you know, if you know how to do it and you do it right the first time. Okay, so that's what this is all about. Now, uh, let's uh, take a couple more minutes. I know this is getting long, that's the other thing. I run these things as long as they have to go. Okay, and I'm not putting limits on like, you know, 12 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. If you want to stop after 20 minutes, that's fine. Start it again when you're in the car or you know, when you're at home, whatever. That's fine. Or skip through it or don't even watch it. That's up to you. But I'm going to take these things through because one of my frustrations is you get into a YouTube video and then they stop it. And then you try to find this, you know, part two or part three or whatever, and you spend hours trying to find that. So I'm, I'm not doing that. So I'm running it all the way through. So some of these videos are going to be long. Okay, so I'm warning you right now. All right, so I'm going to just uh, cut from this and we're going to go down to the training room and I'll just uh, show you the actual state of the layout as we are today. Um, there's been no track painting, there's been no ballast laid. Uh, I'm still working through some of the operational things like the uncoupling and things like that. So uh, it's a fairly um, early in the development stage. So you're going to get to see uh, a lot of stuff. You're going to really, truly see the growth of this railroad. Okay, so we're going to stop it now and uh, I'll be back in a minute. Okay, here we are down in the train room now. So I'm just going to start at this end of the train room. So this is the Sarnia end of the train room or of the uh, layout. And you can see the loop. That's where the uh, ethanol, hopefully the ethanol, and uh, probably soybean uh, processing areas are going to be. And then we move down the track. This is now into the Windsor yard. A few uh, cars there, just to give you perspective. And as we move down from the Windsor yard, this is the interchange uh, um, track which will allow interchange between uh, all of the different uh, motor power that we have. So I'll move down, you'll see the uh, bench work is half inch uh, plywood mounted on uh, two by fours. And I'll show you the, uh, the fascia in a minute. And then this moving down, this is the area that's gonna be the EMD plant. So the General Motors plant. And moving on around here, there's the access point, which is right now a hole, but uh, maybe a lake or something else. And along the tracks beside it uh, will be uh, some industry, probably American can type industry there. Now, I do have some models laid out, but they're just for perspective, they're not in the right place. And then, as you can see, this is the area here for the mine. So this will be the gypsum mine. And then the track moves down and goes down uh, down the escarpment and comes out in two places. So the first place is here, this track. So this track is now ascending up through the escarpment. This track over here, you can see it starts to uh, be inclined there and gradually increases until it then loops underneath the layout over here and comes out the other side and I'll show you that. Now uh, you'll see this, let me just back up a bit here. Okay, so this is the Hamilton area, so the Hamilton yard. And this is going to be the area of the engine facility, so you can see we've started some of the engine facility stuff. And you'll see, there are videos on the installation of the turntable, on uh, the build of the uh, roundhouse, and the build of the engine uh, terminal. There's also another uh, video, another episode on the building of this yard. Now, those of you who are sharp, 
will realize that this yard does not meet, does not match the track plan that I just showed you, and that's because some of these switches had to be changed so that I could get the, uh, I wouldn't have a conflict getting the um, Tortai machines put in. So hopefully that's been taken care of. And then we move over here, you'll see there's a, this is the distance that I was talking about. So this distance is the uh, escarpment, so the Niagara escarpment. So we have to build in some, some nice uh, mountainous, uh, rocky areas here, which are gonna um, portray the escarpment. And then we walk over here and we can see the areas uh, of Simcoe and Hagersville where we're gonna have the uh, gypsum plant over there. I said before it was the gypsum mine over there. And we're gonna walk all the way around under through this hole. And now you can see there's a different view here. So this is um, climbing up the escarpment. And this area here is known on the track plan as Waterford. Okay. And you can see that we have a different um, backdrop here. Now there are videos, uh, there is an episode on installing the backdrop. And now I'm just gonna take you down and show you the fascia. So we have this fascia all the way around the track. There's another episode which shows how we put this fascia in. Okay, so as you can see right now, the train, uh, the railroad is in a very new newbie type uh, situation. None of the track has been painted. None of the track has been ballasted. You see I'm working here on the third control panel. The other two have been installed there and there are also videos on how we made those. And so this third control panel will continue those that video series. This is gonna be a little bit different. Now as we walk along, you'll see the fascia drops off. And that's because this is going to be a lake in here. And this depressed area that's going all the way up is going to be a river coming down into the lake. Okay, so now I'm just going to flip up to the backdrop because we do have a video series or an episode on uh, installing this backdrop. Uh, and if, for those of you who want to install backdrops, uh, I would uh, highly advise you to watch that video because there's a lot of tips in that. Okay, so that's the backdrop area. So what I'm gonna do now is just kind of give you a panning view of the whole layout so far. Now this is phase one. And phase two is going to go into another room and have the steel mill and the power plant and a few other industries in there. So you can see it's multi-level, we have multi-level um, movement, which has caused a lot of engineering problems for the, uh, for me <laughs> and for the railroad. But I think in the end, it's gonna turn out really well because we're gonna have a lot of multi-level stuff happening, uh, trains moving at different uh, levels, and I just think it's gonna be really cool. Okay, now here you will see there are the computer and two control panels and the DC um, accessory uh, amplifier. That's for things like lights and other accessories that require DC. And there's also a episode on how to uh, program the um, this this control panel for the turntable, and also on how to build this um, little control panel I have here. Now I'm I'm now thinking I'm going to consolidate these two control panels into one and design it more like those so that it's all fitting in with the same style but that'll be another episode. Okay, now I'm just gonna take you around. Sorry for the movement. I'm gonna just take you around here, to the back side, and we will go underneath the layout. And you can see 
basically where we have So this is underneath that area where the access hole point is. And you can see we have our wiring, our PM42s, and all of the amplifiers, uh, power supply, um, and the Digitrax uh, power, uh, Dig Digitrax uh, amplifiers and um, boosters here. And i just give you a quick look at the wiring. This is just in one little area underneath the layout. And I'll show you those are some of the tortai that are installed. These green cables are Cat5 cable that is um, going to the tortoise machines back to the control panels. These are the PM42s. So we're going to have another episode on how to program those and uh, some of the difficulties that I had anyway because I didn't think the uh, instructions were very good that um, for these uh, Digitrax products. And I think a company like Digitrax should spend a little more attention on their uh, manuals and on their uh, instructions because for a guy like me, I'm not an electronic person and you know it was difficult and I didn't understand and there was a lot of work and time and frustration that went into finding out how to actually work these things in the end and they should also put more of these little you can see these uh, where are we here you see these little black um, things that will go over they're like little clips that go over. They should give you more of those. They should give you extras because when you want to do programming and you want to do return loops and things like that, reverse loops, there's not enough of those things. And I don't know where to get them. I try to get them. So I just use, you know, standard clips on here, which isn't ideal but it's doing the job for now. So Digitrax people, if you're out there listening, we need extra stuff. When we, when we get the PM42, put a couple extra little pins in and they, they're not that expensive for God's sakes. And it will save lots of time for us. And also make sure your instructions and your, and your um, description of how to do things are much more clear. Okay, so uh, that's my two cents on that. And I'll take you out of here now. And so what I have is just a chair with wheels so I can just roll out. So it's not really a duck under, it's a roll under. Come up. We'll follow this back up. And right here is where I'm having my problems with uncoupling. So I'm going to have to look at dealing with that uh, I'll probably put that in another episode okay so I think we've covered the uh, layout pretty good you can get to see just sort of how it how it looks and how it fits and we will uh, see you in episode two where we will um, start uh, looking at how we put fascia on and then episode three where we put the backdrop on. Okay, and there's many episodes from there. So hopefully you'll stay with me and enjoy the whole show and give us some feedback on the comments. And don't complain too much about the, the time and the length of these things because quite frankly, I'm just gonna keep doing it. So I'm gonna do it until I think uh, the topic's been covered. You can fast forward, you can not watch it, you know, whatever. But that's how we're going to do this. So hopefully you'll enjoy it. And I'll talk to you and see you for episode two. Take care.